happy? Are you happy with selection? Yes. How happy are you? Very. Would you choose this station again? Yes, I would. Shut up! Just let me drive the car. Welcome, COVID enthusiasts, to another episode of Jay Lone's Garage Pandemic Edition. The car I'm featuring today, my 1996 Viper GTS Coupe. You know, I always like the first generation of any car. That's when I think they get it right. I like the first generation Viper. I like the first generation Mustang. You know, then they kind of get fad and, and unwieldy. And I just like that clean first year design. And this one, the Pete Brock inspired coupe. Uh, I, this knocked my socks off when it came out. I just love the look of it. I love the color. I love the stripes. Um, Plus, it was a Viper with air conditioning and roll-up windows, which was, oh, it seemed great. You know, I'd gotten my, uh, my, my other Viper, the convertible. We did that one a couple weeks ago. If you're an enthusiast, you saw that one. And then about two years later, I get a call from uh, Bob Lutz. Hey, Jay, we got a coupe coming out. You know, and I really wasn't looking for a coupe, but I can be talked into buying a car pretty quick. He goes, I want you to have one of the first ones. I said, um, okay, you know, I already got a Viper. Oh, no, not like this. It's got 50 more horsepower, blah, blah, blah. And you know, I'm, I'm glad I bought it. I bought it new. I've had it now, what, what is it, 25 years? Something like that, jeez. It's, it's, it's almost hard to believe. Uh, it still looks good, still runs great. Uh, this has 450 horsepower versus 400, like the Viper. As I mentioned, air conditioning and a few other things. But, oh, and it's the first year of onboard diagnostics, the OBD, which is, at the time seemed something from outer space. You know, have the, you know, you plug in and you read the code, you know. The first car I have that had onboard diagnostics was the McLaren F1. You know how I always try to get the McLaren F1 in every episode? Okay, and when I got that, I remember them telling me it comes with this huge computer deal with some crazy antique laptop. And you can plug it in in California and in England they can analyze what's wrong with you. Oh, well, that's impossible. That doesn't seem like that something from out. No, no, they can actually tell you what's wrong with you. Go, well, how, how can they do that? You know, it just seemed like something uh, science fiction back in the day. Okay. And, you know, I have to admit the onboard diagnostics does help you find problems. I had a number of problems with the car. I had my McLaren SLR and I brought in to get a smog check and the check engine light was on. I couldn't figure out what it was. We plugged it, plugged it in. There was something, pressure from the gas tank somewhere. So we started to take the car apart and I'm looking at it. And I don't like plastic fuel lines, but a lot of cars use them. And there was just a hairline crack. And oh, that's what it was. And I replaced that fuel line and with a brass one actually. And it solved the problem, it went right away. And it would have taken us months to find what the, the problem was. So the onboard diagnostics is, uh, is a pretty cool thing. And this is the first year they were mandatory, at least in the United States. Um, they built about 1166 of these coupes the first year, not a whole lot. You know, it, I went to the plant where they were manufactured. It was Connors Avenue. I believe it's the old Packard plant in Detroit. And it really wasn't much bigger than my garage. And they had kind of a makeshift Viper assembly line there. And everybody had Viper shirts on. And the enthusiasm and the excitement from the men and women working on this project. Because what was Chrysler doing really before the Viper? Just K cars with fake wood on them and LeBaron convertible. You know, just, just hey, we got to make some money. Let's sell some cars. You know, and this was a project they really, really got a kick out of. In fact, when I opened the hood, you'll see that everybody on the line signed it. And I was so honored by that, it was pretty cool. And their names are still here, I'll, I'll show you that in a minute. But uh, as I said, this car is completely stock. My other Viper, we put a 377 uh, rear end in it and we changed the exhaust. And this one we've kept pretty much as it left the factory. And it's fine, it's a great car. Everything works, pretty bulletproof. Don't have a whole lot of miles on it, probably about 11,000. But I use it and it's fun. I take it out maybe once a month and it's just a great car. Let's open the hood and show you what I'm talking about under there. You'll see the V10.
And here's a little piece of automotive trivia for you. This front clip, I believe, is the single most expensive car part, at least at the time of manufacture, of any American car. I think this clip was like $24,000. If you damage this in an accident, boy, you're screwed. But there it is, the classic V10. I guess Lamborghini did the castings on it. It was designed in Detroit, but the castings were done. Don't forget, at that time, uh, Chrysler owned Lamborghini, or had a big stake in it, and they used their casting techniques to do this block. Uh, but the car was designed in the States, basically, uh, based basically on a truck engine, a big V10, a lot of torque. Uh, and, and there's all the names there. You know, it's funny, every time I go to Detroit to do a show at a casino or something, people go up, hey, Jay, how you doing? I'm Don, right fender? What? Don, right fender. Oh, you signed the right fender? Oh, nice to meet you. you know, and people will tell me where they signed on the car. So it's kind of cool. You can see the names. Maybe if you, maybe you can look at it now if you actually did this. Put, mention in the comment section where you signed it. That'd be kind of fun to see. But uh, it's, it's been a fabulous car. I mean, we've been over the Viper history in the other, in the other car. Uh, we kind of went over all of that, so there's not a lot to explain there. Um, but it was really cool to actually go to the plant and see where they built it, because it looked like, it looked like a hot rod shop, basically. It's just the enthusiasm of everybody was great. They were taking on Corvette, and they finally had a halo car. Because, you know, back in the early 90s, Kids were taking down the picture of the Lamborghini with the Alpine stereo and putting the Viper up because it was American, it had a lot of horsepower, and it was classic American muscle and a sports car, and it was a real sports car. I mean, there's a, a crudeness about it, which is somewhat endearing, I think. Uh, people like that. Uh, they're strong, they're powerful. Uh, never really had any problems with it. The first generation, I talked about that in the other video, uh, we put new pistons and everything, well, Chrysler did under warranty, because uh, it was a first generation, first year, you know. Uh, but by this time, they would got it down. Everything works fine. And it's nice to have a Viper with air conditioning and all those things, too. No traction control, no ABS, none of that. Um, let's open up the back, too. I'll show you how that works. So the cool thing is you, you have a Viper that you could actually use as a normal car. As much as I like my Viper uh, Roadster, you couldn't park it anywhere. You couldn't lock the doors. You couldn't even lock the uh, glove compartment for people taking your registration. You put the tonneau cover on it, but that's not going to protect anything. Whereas this one has, you know, regular ceiling windows, the electric that roll out. It was fantastic. Yeah, let me, let me open the, I guess, the rear hatch. There's quite a bit of space. You get a full-size spare. And if you're an enthusiast who, could take, who uh, collects paper towels from the 90s, well, this is a very rare one. You see, it's quilted. So that makes it even more valuable. Unopened, untouched. What's it worth today? Priceless, really. Where are you going to find another one? So anyway, if you collect these, this is the way to go. And something else you got back in the 90s, we got a pretty nice... Viper book, uh, pretty much standard manual, not, not as many stupid lawyer warnings as you get today, but, uh, but the usual ones. But, you know, it's just fun to save all this stuff. Put this right back in there. Oh, an extra quart of oil. I don't know if this oil is any good anymore. It's been here. Oil <laughs> can start to separate after 25 years. But as you see, it's a nice shape. Um, they did a good job. The early Vipers were so crude that the fit and finish just got better as they got to these coupes. Everybody likes this. He's, they called this the Gurney bubble for Dan Gurney because Dan was tall and when he wore a helmet, he couldn't. So that was to give you a little extra headroom. That was something they did for the race cars for Dan Gurney. And it has a lot of little touches on it. You know, I like the racing filler cap, and underneath it's a traditional filler cap, but it's still kind of cool. Got these functional vents here that get the heat out. <clears throat> this was, uh, I'd say the mid-90s, really the heyday. There was so much Viper excitement around that it was taken on Corvette, and it was a little bit more expensive than the Corvette, but 
the, the saving thing was it had more horsepower and it was a V10. So uh, it started a real rivalry between Corvette and, and, uh, and Viper. And you know, I think it improved the breed. You know, I, I'm one of those people whose competition makes both sides stronger. Because I've, I've said this before, the most powerful Corvette you could get, I think, at the time was what, 350 horsepower, something like that. And there's no reason to really up it much more because why? You know, you didn't need to. Uh, well, you had the Z06 that came along, but I think that was more answer to the, to the Viper. Everybody started playing that horsepower game, which is fun, especially if you're an enthusiast. They always want to make it a little bit better than the next guy. So I think Viper and, and Corvette complemented each other. I liked it because now there were two real American sports cars. Now we have three, if you count Mustang, which has really come into its own uh, lately as well. But I, I, I just get a kick out of these. I, I like this. It's a fun car to drive. Let's take a look at the interior. Uh, interior, a very nice place to be. Something unique to Viper, at least the coupes. I don't know if the later uh, roadsters had this. The seat does not move, but the pedals do. You reach down here, you turn this knob, and it moves the pedals forward or backward, which is kind of cool. Uh, you've got standard tachometer, goes to about 5,500, 6,000. Speedometer, 200 mile an hour speedometer. Uh, water temperature, oil pressure, gas tank, uh, battery ammeters. Uh, you got a CD player, ooh, that's the 90s. And uh, even has a cigarette lighter that, well, look, with a real cigarette on it. That's, there you go. And now it's a power plug. But back then, it was still a cigarette lighter. Um, electric windows, I guess, and door locks, too. You had, of course, the uh, airbag steering wheel. I have my early Viper with the pre airbag steering wheel. I don't know. There's just something minimalist about it that I enjoy. Handbrake is right here, like a sports car. And you got your ashtray right there. Uh, six-speed gearbox. These are actually nice cars. You can actually go cross-country. You can drive them. You can use them as regular cars because I said it's got an alarm system. You can lock it and all that kind of stuff because we've kind of gone over the whole Viper story the last time. If you want to go back and watch that one with the Roadster. Uh, this is just, again, the second generation, the Coupe, which I think is, was a huge success. I think it's just it was a great idea and just a good looking car, you know. I remember Lutz telling me we were talking about this <clears throat> and he said half the people love the car and half the people hate it. He says, and that's what you want. You want a car that gets emotion out of people. You know, you could design a Toyota Corolla and people go, that's kind of nice, it's okay. I don't hate it, I don't like it. Well, you want people to either love it or hate it because the people who hate it are never going to buy it. But the people who love it just have to have it. And that's sort of the key, you know. If it's, this is never a take it or leave it kind of car. Eh, maybe, maybe not. You're either just crazy for this thing or you, you can't stand it. And uh, I was one of those people who was crazy for it. Come on, let's take it next door. I can't believe this car is 25 years old. I, I, I don't know why that it just seems so, it, it goes by so quickly. It's amazing. Yet, very competent automobile, fast, handles nicely. You know, no, you can do burnouts with it. You can hang the tail out a little bit. I mean, it's uh, it's a great car. These are a lot of fun. I was sorry to see the Viper run its course. You know, I think it just got so expensive. By the end, they were something like uh, 125, 130 thousand dollars, something like that. It just got too expensive, especially compete against the Corvette. I mean, the Corvette, they have got that down. I mean, the fact that you can buy a C8 for $60,000, I mean, that's, that's pretty unbelievable. I mean, you, can, you, can, you, can, you, can, you can't restore a car for that these days. I mean, so it, it's pretty amazing. I think the Viper will come back in some form. I think it's too valuable a name and, you know, too legendary a car. But there's enough around so they become collector's items. And they hold their value pretty well. I mean, I think these coupes probably go in the forty to $65,000 range, something like that now. And it, I mean, I love this V10. It just pulls so strong. And as much as I love my Viper Roadster, you can't go anywhere with it. 
you always have to park it like if you're in a restaurant like okay I'll eat can I see my car from the table you know, somebody's touching it somebody's yeah it's always somebody fooling with it at least this you can lock it and walk away and that's one thing I always liked about Chrysler you could get vast amounts of horsepower at a reasonable price the demon, okay, $80,000 is a tremendous amount of money. But to get that kind of horsepower in something European, you're up in the hundreds of thousands of dollar range. You know, you're looking at, I know, Veyrons and just crazy money, Ferraris and Lamborghinis and all that kind of stuff. And the fact that you can get that kind of horsepower and that kind of speed is, is uh, one of those American egalitarian things, you know. Horsepower for the masses, that kind of deal. And these make wonderful used cars. You know, the nice thing about Vipers is, especially the Roadsters, uh, for most people, they were a weekend car. So they didn't rack up a lot of miles. Not many people commuted to work every day in a Viper, although I'm sure plenty did. Uh, so you see them 25, 30 years old with 8,000 miles, 10,000 miles, like mine. You know, mine's are, mine was a collector car from day one. I put it in the garage and I, take it out and use it sparingly on nice days. In fact, my Black Viper, I don't believe, except getting caught in the rain once, has never really been wet. That's why the paint and everything looks so good on it. I guess this is what Chrysler would call a halo car, anybody would call a halo car, meaning it helps to sell other cars. You know, the Vipers brought people into the showrooms and they wound up buying a minivan or a LeBaron or something. Uh, and that's okay. They didn't make a whole lot of Vipers, but um, their impact was significant. I mean, I think it really captured the imagination of the American muscle car enthusiasts because there really wasn't much around in the mid-90s. Corvette was about all you had. Mustang was good. It was okay, but it was not outrageous, you know. Uh, when this came out with 450 horsepower, it was a bit like the Demon with 800 horsepower. You just went, what? car has presence. I love the style of it. I think you could park this among a group of Euro European exotics and not uh, be embarrassed. And although sometimes the European car magazines can be a little uh, snobby about, <laughs> about American stuff, I find that people are not. You know, when I, God, it's almost 20 years ago, I took a Corvette on the Autobahn and everywhere we stopped, crowds would gather around, people thought it was the coolest car, and I'm thinking, it's just a Corvette, but it, it made quite an impression. I love looking over that long hood, the way it kind of just drops off. And you know what I like about cars in this period? When I turn on the radio, I just turn it on. The volume is either up or down. I hate modern cars where you have to hold the button and go, beep, beep, beep. are you happy with selection? Yes. How happy are you? Very. Would you choose this station again? Yes, I would. Shut up! Just let me drive the car. Some nice touches. You got this overhead thing here where you can keep uh, your garage door opener or other thing. Oh, is a six dollar bill somebody put in there as a gag and what is this a parking garage yeah. and you got interior lights look at that yeah, good. don't get that in the roadster you know I, I like keeping something like this stock I don't because you know I've got plenty of cars that have more than 450 horsepower. It's just nice to have this exactly as it was from the factory. I think it makes it the most valuable because so many people screw with them. People forget what it was like when they were new. I'm sure there's probably a better quick shifter you could put in it, but this one's okay. I can live with it. It's pretty flattering to Pete Brock. You know, he designed the Daytona Coupe, and this basically what this is it's a modern interpretation of that you know with the cam back tail and all that kind of stuff as i said before the seats are fixed but the steering wheel actually is adjustable and the pedals are adjustable so 
six and one and a half a dozen the other. One thing American manufacturers do way better than the Europeans is uh, heating and air conditioning. I mean, I've got this air conditioner on, you can't even hear it, and it's plenty cold inside here. It's about 100 degrees here today in LA. And yet, it's fine. say horsepower sells cars torque wins races and this has got a lot of torque hope you enjoyed this drive to the gts coupe they're quite civilized they're great cars they make great used cars i highly recommend this and the viper club is terrific i mean there's every possible uh question you can have about them these guys uh, men and women actually of the club can help you out they do uh, it's really good you know, I got to uh, host one of the Viper International things in Vegas one year, and it was a lot of fun uh, just meeting all the Viper owners and seeing the modifications they've done to their car. I picked up a lot of good tips. So anyway, if you're thinking to get one of these, you can't go wrong. And uh, we'll see you next week with uh, something else. Hopefully you'll find it interesting. All right, you guys. Bye-bye. Mm-hmm. <laughs>